There we go. We're recording. Hey, I'm uh, Stephen Oliver again. I guess I can take my glasses off and keep it from reflecting in them again here. Uh, Grant, are you in California or uh, uh, Canada now? You're in British Columbia? I'm, I'm in British Columbia today. Well, I'll introduce you and then let you give the background. I, I got familiar with you because I read your excellent book, uh, Guerrilla Marketing for Financial Advisors, that you authored, co-authored with uh, J. Conrad Levinson. And um, I thought it was very, very, very well done. In the meantime, I've cyber stalked you and tracked you down on LinkedIn and any, any number of other places. But uh, I think we come at it from a, 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 a different way of looking at the world, but with very similar ideas. Um, but give everybody a little bit of your background. You got started in the uh, in the life insurance side, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I got started, you know, 33 plus years ago as an advisor. And, you know, I... Along the way, you, you go to meetings and conferences and you you met different advisors. And so you, you basically, you always wanted to figure out, you know, what top advisors are doing now, mm -hmm. you know, not like what, what I'm going to do in the future. What can I do today to really grow my business? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you become a student of the business and it, and it gets kind of addicting, as you know, you know, you've written lots of books oh, and yeah. materials. And so you, you just absorb this over time. And so, you know, my story was I became an advisor for several years and we built up a a uh, investment uh, investment dealership and we sold that successfully to another firm mm -hmm. and then i built up a practice of you know clients and we had you know well over 120 plus million dollars and uh, two advisors came along and bought my practice my building everything else like that and so i was basically i figured out i was good at building businesses and so I became a, uh, the national director of practice management for Manulife and, you know, worked with John Hancock in the U.S. on building practice management, which is all about building a better business, becoming a better business person. Sure. And, and Steve and I learned all the stuff I wish I knew when I was a financial advisor in that process. That was the copy. That was the name of my first book, Everything I Wish I Knew When I Was 22. <laughs> exactly. 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 And so now you're armed with this knowledge and information like, so I hit a crossroads. Do I go back and build another practice, which I could do, build another business? Or do I, you know, help advisors and, and educate the industry and give back, you know, and help them build better businesses? So I, I went down that path to start because I it was it was like always curious. And that was 10 years ago and I haven't looked back. And it's just grown from there. The the appetite to of the financial business, you know growing up and becoming better business people is as you know that's that's why you and i are here Stephen. you bet you bet you know I, I i've been asked that question several times when i on the consulting coaching side they say you grew this multi-million dollar business now why are you spending your time teaching us to do it and my response has always been well i get a lot more leverage um because rather than me working directly with clients i'm now impacting thousands if not millions of, of clients directly through my clients and i think we we both end up uh, or at, at least i'll speak for myself you end up in a point where you're more concerned about the impact on the on the clients and the impact on the people you're working with than than uh, uh necessarily the money i mean you, you know it's good to make money and you know live in nice places and so forth but ultimately that impact oftentimes becomes the the, the more primary driver especially as you you know, age into this a little bit, I would say. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I have this saying that, you know, people ask me, I always ask people, what do you, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? And, you know, my why is very simple, straightforward. You know, you're right, Steve. I, I can only help so many people as a financial advisor, you know, a hundred, maybe 150 mm -hmm. ideal families. I can now, my goal, my target is to help 20,000 families get comprehensive planning and advice mm -hmm. so they can accomplish more. You bet. And that's, and that's my mission. And so when I go to meetings, conferences, I do the podcast, we can help people accomplish more. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, I track that 20,000. I hit the, my original goal was 10,000 and I kind of surpassed that. You know, I could only do 150 as an advisor. I got to 10,000. That's great. Now we're going to get to 20,000 and yeah. see where it goes. So that's, you're exactly right. That's the difference maker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what your what your actual um, um, implementation strategies are with your clients. So when you're helping with their, them with their practice management, and 
like I said, I was cyber stalking you. So I watched a couple of your presentations today and so forth. Uh, what well, one of the, uh, I hadn't turn, heard the term before. I heard you say ice cap, ideal client experience and client acquisition process was one of the, one of the ones I pulled up from uh, uh, one of your uh, discussions. I think it was, um, now his name's going to slip my mind, Bill. Um, Bill Backrack. Backrack. Yeah, it was, it was, you were, you were speaking to, uh, to his audience uh, and talking about that. But if you take on a, a new practice and let's say they have six or seven people in house and they're a, you know, a halfway successful uh, a practice already, what do you start? What do you look at? And what, what's your, what's your first steps with them? Yeah, there's kind of like five or six elements that we kind of look at. And then, you know, element number one, you know, what's your business plan? What's your business model? Mm -hmm. And a lot of advisors need clarity around what that is going to be yeah. in the future, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many successful business models, but, you know, I, I, I use this analogy, especially in the financial world, where they work with a firm and the firm gives them processes. Mm -hmm. And when you fly a plane, Stephen, each plane has its own manual. Mm -hmm. So the firm gives out the manual for a 747. Yeah. But, but wait a minute, I'm flying a Cessna 172 here. It mm -hmm. doesn't work, right? right. Yeah. So each advisory practice needs to have clarity around their business model mm -hmm. and clarity around their processes to run their business. You bet. They actually have to build the checklist themselves yeah. for their own each practice, right? You bet. And, and and so that's that's the first thing is that, you know, the clarity around your business. You know, you talk all day long, Stephen, about your marketing and your marketing plan. So you have to have clarity around, you know, who it is you're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. to try to identify, find, meet, and acquire, right? Identifying 75% of financial advisors we know don't have a clear definition of who their ideal client is. Of course. But the 25% that do earn 33% more than other advisors that don't. So, hey, let's start there. Let's let's have a clear definition of that and and, and get clarity around that. So I, 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 I Not to interrupt, but I might say that even the 25% is being pretty generous, I think, to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it changes, right? And, yeah. and it's and it's fluid and it's constant and and. And so there's there's some key criteria there, as you, you and I know, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so that, that's part number two. So we can, we come up with part number one is clarity on your business and your business plan and, and really getting that, you know, in writing part number two, obviously your, your marketing plan and writing part number three is your processes. And there's nine areas to systematize your practice. And we work on those nine areas. And usually there's, you know, maybe two or three areas, there's always areas to work on because we know the more successful advisors and the more successful teams have more processes than the advisors that don't. You bet. So we work on process, Yeah. right? And we get to work on process because how often does someone call you up and say, hey, do you want to work on your processes? It's like, yeah. okay, well, yeah, we, we need to do this. And so, you know, number four is your team. And we go through this evolution in the industry and you see it all the time. You go from a solo advisor, you know, to an, a team advisor to as what Philip Palaviv calls an ensemble or an enterprise practice. Right. And, and all three of those practices have the unique challenges, but they all have one thing in common. It's people mm -hmm. and people are your best investment. And how are you investing in the people? What are you doing? How do you track, maintain it? It's, you know, we didn't get in this business to to do HR, but you're a business owner. You have to. Oh, right? yeah. And HR yeah. has been a challenge, as you know, in North mm -hmm. America in oh, the yeah. past couple of years, right? Oh, yeah. Right? Everybody wants to go to a four-day work week now. What do you mm -hmm. do about that? I've got four firms that are now four-day work weeks, right? Yeah. So, And they don't want to go in the office ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got some top advisors that are thinking of, canceling their office, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, going through that process. Absolutely. So that, that becomes a challenge. And so we take all these, you know, four or five areas and, you know, Peter Drucker had a great quote, you know, it gets measured, gets managed, you bet. but I added to it. I said, what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. Right. And so what's not getting measured. So we really want to collect all this information and get that key data 
so that you can make better decisions as a business owner. Yeah. And, and that's what we come up with is, you know, what, what's your data? What are you, what are the data points? What's the information you're trying to collect so that you can make the better decisions? You bet. You bet. Right? And then we take all that and we say, okay, what's the, what's the ultimate, what's the exit plan look like? Mm -hmm. And that exit plan, as you know, it takes, you know, one to five to even 10 years to sometimes plan out. Right. Sure. Sure. And so that's really the six kind of components and facets of really running a business. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and we just take that my 33 years of experience is all in financial. So we just take that business model. We call it practice management. We apply it to financial advisors, businesses. You bet. And out of that comes, comes typically the top three challenges and I'll give them to you. Uh, you know, most people know them, but number one is capacity, mm -hmm. right? Capacity is all, always an issue. And, and there's a difference between capacity and time management, right? But we could talk about that. You bet. You know, but number two, which is you're the master of, is, is ideal client acquisition. Right. You know, that finding, meeting, acquiring. Yeah, we can all get more clients. But, you know, I'll give one little tip I talk, talk about at conferences is the referral myth. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you the little inside scoop. I have a cool seat in the, in the, in the business. You know, I'm on the wealth professional. I'm a, I'm a judge on the awards. So I see what top advisors do. And I've been a judge for several years. So I mm -hmm. see what top advisors do and I work with top advisors. Yeah. And I can tell you one thing that they don't just build their business by referrals. No. And everyone thinks these are successful advisors and that's all they do is build by referrals. You and I know that that's a myth. Yeah. Yeah. Because does someone with a million dollars refer someone with five million? No. No. If you want the same results over and over, it's the definition of insanity, by the way. But mm -hmm. if you want the same thing over and over, that's fine. Yeah. But if you want to move up market, you have to do something completely different, don't of you? Of course. Oh, yeah. Right? Right? So we talk a bit about that. So those are kind of like some of the key overview things that we, mm -hmm. we focus on. And, and have really good conversations about, okay, how can we tackle, you know, capacity? How can we tackle, you know, the client acquisition piece? And then how can we put this in and implement this? And that's where the implementation fails is they need someone to really, you know, tell them what they need to do. Right. They know what to do. You can yeah. access anything that you want online. Like you and I, you, we know mm. where to find it. Yeah. It's actually implementing that that's, that's the difference between the average and the, you know, the elite advisor. So that's really what I, we focus on. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, people I work with, all the stuff that I tell them is stuff that they can find, they can read books one thing or another. But it's if somebody looking over their shoulder every week and having a peer group of people who are implementing the ideas and having both that accountability. But as you mentioned, we, you know, we, we call it focusing on their stats, looking at the numbers, looking at from whether it's a marketing standpoint and how many leads, how many appointments, how many uh, meetings do we get, how many new clients do we get, were they uh, qualified or unqualified all the way down through the rest of the practice. It, it, and it always seems to me in, in working with, a, with a, a new advisor, it seems to me they, they almost always think that they need better new client acquisition strategies. And in reality, everything else is broken. <laughs> so if you double or triple the number of new people coming into their pipeline, they're just going to be double or triple as, as frenzied and hectic and out of control as, as they already are, right? The, yeah. uh, um, the, the second element on, I, I don't know why it is, but most people do a very bad job of identifying who they want to work with. And I, I know in early in your career, it's, you know, you got to pay the bills and if they can fog a mirror and, you know, put a few pennies in your pocket, you, you, you feel like you have to take them. But unless you really go through the, the thinking about who do I like working with, who likes working with me, I'm going to click with a category of people. I'm not going to click with some other categories of people who are people who financially are going to be the right fit for me, whose goals and objectives are going to be the right fit. It, it amazes me that that really doesn't, doesn't happen. I, I probably talked to 200 advisors. And they all tell me, well, I want to work with 50 and 60 year olds who have at least a half a million dollars. Could you narrow it down a little bit? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. What's in yeah. your resume? Who, who, you know, who are your top 10 clients that you really, you know, are a joy to the spirit that you, that you like working with, which by the way, I think is our benefit is we get a chance really to only work with people we really want, want to work with. And, you know, the, the uplift in your lifestyle and being able to be really selective makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you said one thing that really resonates with, with me that I always talk about is, you know, when, you, when you're working with your clients and when advisors are working with your clients, you know, there's kind of a couple deliverables here. You know, the one deliverable is the conversations you have with them. Yeah. And then out of those conversations, you put together planning, advice, products, and services. But, but what's more valuable to the client? The conversations? or the planning and advice. Yeah. It's the conversations that provide the value, isn't it's it? It's the relationship. Yeah. Right. It's the relationship and it's the conversations that you have that generate more planning, more advice, more value, more deliverables. You so bet. If you, want to, if you want to generate more revenue, you need to have more conversations, deeper conversations <laughs> with, with, with people. And yeah. it's a weird business when you actually think about the this way. Hey, we get paid to sit and have conversations all day long. Yeah. But that's actually our value, isn't it? You bet. You Asking bet. the questions, you know, really helping people, you know, get clarity around what they're really mm -hmm. truly trying to accomplish, map that out on paper, give them the map and say, hey, is this the house you're trying to build? That's yeah. the one. Let's go for it. Yeah. And that's yeah. a process. And, and at, at looking at that from a 180 degree uh, uh, perspective, I think it's true on the other side as well. The client is much more interested in who you are and what makes you interesting and what makes you a human being that I like to interact with and why do I trust you than all of your credentials, your degrees, your alphabet soup and all of that other stuff. And it seems to me that advisors spend way too much time on all this stuff that really isn't the, the secret sauce. The secret sauce is what makes you a unique individual, what makes me trust and like you, what creates the relationship that gives me unshakable comfort that I'm in good hands with you and really wants me to interact with you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, talking to an advisor this, you know, to this, this week, and he jokingly said, yeah, in 30 years, one of his top clients, this is the amount of time, mm -hmm. very little, that he talked about portfolio management. Yeah. That's all he's done is really manages his portfolio. That's the portfolio management piece. Mm -hmm. Everything else was about goals and aspirations and planning and where you're going and help giving clarity and direction. Right. You bet. You bet. Or your fishing trip or what's, you know, what's going, what's going on in their personal life and, and how they feel about that and how, how things are unfolding. I mean, Pete, uh, an advisor really is kind of a combination, not to, not to poke anybody's buttons, but it's kind of a confessor and a, a psychologist and a, a friend and somebody who's, who really needs to be there and, and, and be a real person rather than, I mean, and frankly, if you're not, I mean, with the direction of AI and all the online stuff and so forth, you know, your technical expertise is going to be replaced pretty quickly, I'm afraid. Absolutely. And we always say this, you know, AI or robo advisors, they're not going to replace advisors. No. They're just going to replace crappy advisors. You bet. Right. And, you know, that's what technology does. And, and an interesting point on that is, you know, everyone thinks, okay, yeah, AI and it's going to help us, you know, grow and multiply. I want to, I want the advisors to listen to, to think about this a little bit differently. Let's say you're, you know, you got ideal clients of a hundred. Now with technology and AI, I can have 200 ideal clients. No, think about this differently. Yeah. Keep a hundred clients, move up market. Yeah. Right. It's the same number of relationships. But now we get to move up market because we get to deliver more value in a quicker, faster fashion with these ideal people. Don't just get more clients. I mean, you'll get a few more clients. That's part of it. But now we can do so much more. And, and we're seeing advisors, you know, leveraging technology to get into those markets that they couldn't have done in the past with, without this technology. That's the interesting part. Now we can, you know, really help, you know, 
a lot more people delivering more comprehensive planning and more advice, they're actually getting more. At, at a much, much higher level. And, and I, Absolutely. I, I, I think that's the, the, the exciting part is yeah. both, and, and you mentioned it before, is higher value clients to you, but providing a much higher value, higher perceived value to them. And, and again, I mean, you know, everybody wants to talk about, I can beat the S and P or what, you know, whatever, but really what they want to do is they want to have somebody looking over things that they're comfortable with, that they want to have a relationship with that adds value to, you know, every area and who's truly interested in them. And, and that's few and far between, as you know, and I, I don't think it's intentional. Most people in this business are truly good human beings and are truly concerned about their clients. They just miss what the value add is and focus on on the technical rather than on the relationship and the 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 true holistic development of the client. Yeah, yeah. And I and I love the stat by John Bowen. He said 84% of the wealthy engage emotionally first and logic second. Yeah. And so it's the emotional engagement, the emotional marketing that's going to you know, a, attract and acquire these ideal clients. It's not the logical tax planning, investment management, wealth management, insurance planning. This is all logic, 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 logic. And you and I see it, Stephen. Majority of the marketing is logical, not emotional. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. And 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 I I think in all sales, doesn't matter what it is. You know, on on one end it's a boat, on the other end it's a financial product all decisions pretty much get made emotionally and then rationalized logically. Correct. Right. So, <laughs> so you, 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 you've got to give them the data after they made the decision, but, but not really before, uh, uh, which is, which is strange, a strange paradox, but it, it's certainly reality. Yeah. Don't, don't argue with me that you and your spouse bought your house on a logical path. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. No, it's, you, both you, sides. it's both sides. You got to do the logical side. But it was an emotional decision as well as a logical decision. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've got a story about buying this house that I'm in right now, and it had nothing to do with, you know, all of the all of the spreadsheet of what we were looking for. You know, it was it was an immediate reaction uh, by the wife, not by 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 me. But, you know, um, and, and, and that's something, by the way. That. I see a lot that that advisors don't even get both, uh, uh, you know, husband and wife or everybody involved in the family into the thing and then wonder why they crash and burn. You know, they think a lot of them still think, well, I'm just going to deal with the husband and he can explain it to his wife. And that's like the most dated thinking in the world. Uh, what um, I think what we we uh, we find in this area, you know, take it outside of this niche. It was the story of GM and how they crashed and burned, right? Is is uh, they found the auto buying decision was like eighty five percent the the wife, eighty five percent female driven, and all of the marketing was being done by seventy year old men living in Detroit who had never you know seen what the roads were like in uh, Calif Southern California, for instance, um, and they completely missed the mark. The turnaround from Cadillac was putting in a younger female marketing person who knew that it was a female driven product. It wasn't a, a male driven product. And I, I, I still see a lot of, you know, as you know, for all the talk of diversity and everything, the vast majority of advisors who are making money in the industry are 50 to 60 white male conservatives. Right. And if they, if they haven't gotten the idea that it's the wife making the decision and that they have to focus in that way, they're completely missing the boat there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I got a couple points on that. And, you know, number one, I've got a couple uh, teams of advisor where there's a male female mm -hmm. and they both meet with husband and wife yeah. toge together. So there's four people in on that meeting mm -hmm. and they have a great meeting. They have great conversations and then they go for lunch. And then sometimes the females talk to the females and the males talk to the males mm -hmm. and they build that relationship even deeper. Yeah. And it's phenomenal how that works. Mm -hmm. and, and And I've seen that you know, kind of in, in action. And, and so that's, that's the first piece is actually, yeah, that, that human dynamic, you know, most, uh, most conferences that you're going to go to, if you're going to go to any conference in the next 12 months, make sure there's a human behavior element or speaker. There's you tons can. of great, you, you've got tons of great resources. There's tons of great resources on that, but that's, that's a critical piece that human behavior and male, female, female piece. And, you know, understanding, 
you know, different types of people, like every single movie or TV show is made by four characters, understanding the four kind of quadrants of people, you know, Seinfeld, yeah. Friends, you, yeah. the list goes on and on and on. It's yeah. four characters. So understanding people, that human behavior element piece is is even becoming more and more important as you as you move up market. And we right. it's dramatically more important in my perspective, especially again, as we talk about AI, robo advisors, all that stuff killing off the bottom end of advisors. The top end are going to be the ones that truly have that emotional uh, intelligence and that ability to deal with. You know, I, I stumbled across that, you know, ass backwards, I guess. But, you know, I, I um, um, thought I was going to end up in the financial business. Everyone in my family was in the financial business. I uh, graduated from Georgetown Economics with a degree, Georgetown University with a degree in economics, thinking that that's where I was going to end up with and ended up opening a chain of martial arts schools. And <laughs> with, 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 within three years, I had 3,500 students, but I learned real quickly that all my advertising for, and this was kids market, was all aimed at mom. Is mom was the driver, mom was the decision maker. And in in that industry, almost, you know, probably 95%, they maybe 99% of schools are owned by, you know, a male. And the ones that try to get in the kids market, they miss the fact that the sales process has to be 100% directed at mom. Dad has to be involved, but he's only there so he doesn't veto things right and although the marketing is directed at mom that's the driver but but they miss the point i mean everything from you know dirty bathrooms and no toilet paper in the bathrooms to the uh, the first impression they completely miss the mark on on who their market is and especially who's who's ultimately going to be in charge of saying whether the check gets written or not yeah yeah that, that that's that's brilliant that's doing your market research and and that's that's you know if you don't mind me sharing a, a marketing idea or strategy. All. So, you know, everybody asked me, you know, how did you build your, your business so fast? And one of the things I did was I, I did a lunch in for, you know, 10 or 12 clients. And I thought mm -hmm. I'm going to bring them in, I'm going to say thanks, buy them lunch. And I just wanted feedback because I was going to do a whole bunch of different marketing avenues and angles and strategies. And I, you know, I'm like, okay, why don't we just ask these people before I do it, you know, before I spend a, you know, thousands of dollars and, and get their feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And I brought them in, Hey, you know, I'm thinking of doing this and this and this and, 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 you know, long story short, one of the, you know, every single person there, there's 10 people there. They said, Oh no, that's good ideas. That's good. That's bad. They gave me some really good feedback and, mm -hmm. you know, here's some ideas, you know, to, to really help, you know, communicate better with your clients. And here's some ideas like, it, it was very, very valuable feedback. And each person I said, I'm going to just follow up and just have a quick little follow-up call. And the first person I called said, hey, Grant, yeah, I know what you're trying to accomplish. You know what? Instead of doing all that marketing stuff, I'm just going to send over my my really good friends. I know you're trying to grow your business. I'm just going to introduce them to you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, thanks. The next person I called, hey, yeah, I see what you're kind of doing, you know. I, th I think the best thing I'd be doing is just get some introductions. So I've talked to my friends and neighbors and I'm going to give you their names and, and we're going to set up a meeting with them. Yeah. I was, I was shocked. And the third, fourth, fifth person, they saw that I was working on my business. They were willing to help and, and introduce me to people. I wasn't asking for referrals. I was asking for introductions, which is a lot easier you bet. Than, than referrals. Would you mind introducing me to anybody, mm -hmm. everybody? Absolutely. And I was going to client events and getting introductions. And lo and behold, Stephen, I said, holy crap, how many of these events could I do in a year? Oh, and yeah. I got, and I did feedback events for my clients and I did like, I did them every quarter. And that really was the catalyst of most of my growth from my practice. Yeah. Right. It started yeah. exactly what you did is like, Hey, let's, let's do a little bit of research and find out who's the actual buyer here. And, and let's try to hone in on how we can make this a great buying experience mm -hmm. for these people and target to them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and part of, of that whole experience is just having the awareness to recognize opportunity. And yeah. uh, I'm always kind of amazed at how, you know, people like click off part of their brain in, in, in any mode and they don't, they don't see it. I know in, in, in my own business over the years, you know, I ended up here, here in Denver with the, 
uh, CFO of the Denver Broncos football team, uh, the marketing director of the of the um, Denver Nuggets, um, uh, the CEO of, of uh, Norwest, uh, you know, formerly um, now Wells Fargo, and the regional director for McDonald's, and you could go on and on and on the list. One of the, one of the better ones was the uh, human resources director for the number one employer in the state at the time. They had forty uh, U.S. West, one of the baby bells uh, back in the day, and. You know, before you know, another one was a, a CEO of a 780 or 760 million dollar electronics chain. Well, all of a sudden, once they're thrilled with you, all these doors open, right? And um, but if if you're not, if you're not paying attention to it, that's um, I, I kind of got started back into uh, uh, coaching with this by working with uh, you know one of the top five, top ten at Northwestern Mutual, who I happen to already have a relationship as a client. And first thing I said to him is, let's go through your client list. You know, let's, who do you have now? Who do you like? Who do you not like? And by the way, who are they? And what are their, what are the opportunities here? And, you know, he, he, he was talking about them from a client base. I said, no, but where do they work? What company do they own? Who, what clubs are they involved with? What organizations are they involved with? Have you, you know, nowadays with LinkedIn, have you looked at their profile and see what the charities they support? And 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 your idea there again, I, I'm stealing from one of your uh, presentations was, um, you know, getting invited to charitable events and getting invited to events that that they do. I've any number of times over the years had clients do endorsed mailings to 100% their client list, bring us along for events anywhere from 10 people to you know, 40,000 of them. Um, and there's just so many opportunities once you just open your mind to that um, mm -hmm. and and do that. I think the other thing, and I heard you say this earlier in my uh, cyber stalking is, uh, but it's so true. An awful lot of your best clients don't even recognize that you're out looking for other clients. I heard somebody else on a podcast say, and I'd give attribution if I remembered who it was, but the comment was is, most of your clients don't even know the range of problems you're able to solve for people. All they really understand is what you did for them. Um, when I first got involved with uh, my client, Peter, I had a bunch of employees at the time. I was looking for deferred executive compensation, golden handcuff type of things, retirement plans and so forth. And for years after that, I, I'm sure I had him niched as that's what he does. Yep. And if I came across somebody who needed that, I would have pointed at him at him, but there's, you know, 90% of what he was capable of doing would like to have done. I really wouldn't have been top of mind, probably wouldn't have had any awareness at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, a great example of that is I, I always ask people, who are your ideal clients? Mm -hmm. That's a trick question. It is. Because I then go, how do you go from an ideal client? And how do you double that revenue? Change the word to ideal family. You bet. You got siblings, Stephen? Yep. I, I don't, but I. I... <laughs> right, right. But, you know, if yeah. you had siblings yeah. and yeah. parents, not yeah. necessarily your kids, but siblings yeah. and parents, if I get the whole family, and some families are very large, you get the whole mm -hmm. family or a big chunk of the family. You tripled, quadrupled. Right? Exactly. You turn yeah. an ideal client into an ideal family. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just turn 10 of your ideal clients into 10 ideal families this year, yeah. the revenue lift is massive, right? And, you know, the the the, the, the parallels across industry are always are always stark. I was, um, um, you know, the, 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 the number one thing we tell the martial arts schools is when you enroll a kid, enroll their parents. Um, <laughs> I like that. I love that. I like you know, that. And yeah, it, yeah. It, it it improves retention and improves the value. It improves er, er, everything about the the experience. But it's ex ex exactly the same. I, yeah. uh, you know, across industries, I recently did a keynote at a uh, a convention of music school owners who all have exactly the same problem as every financial advisor I've ever I've ever talked to. Uh, they, they need better client acquisition. They need a better sales process. And really, they, they don't even recognize the problem, but they have massive staff problems uh, with, you know, with this much training for their staff, with this many people um, uh, 
spread spread around. It's like, you know, it it, it just doesn't matter what you're doing. It, it they everybody has the same problems. Yeah, it, it, well, and you pointed to that. It, you know, you got a problem, build a process. Yeah. What is what is your process? And that's what you and I dissect all day long. You bet. What what is your process? Imagine you have a second set of eyes looking at your process of what you're doing. What do you do first? Then what do you do next? And what does that look like? And and walking people through, and I do this all the time, walk me through your prospect journey. I'm a prospect. Walk me through the journey. What does that look like? And well, yeah. I do this and then this and this. And how about this? How about this? How? And all of a sudden they realize that's the problem mm -hmm. in their client acquisition. Mm -hmm. And that they, they see it clear as day, but you and I see it because we call it their blind spots. We, we can't see our blind spots. It's, you know, it's like me asking you, Hey, what's your blind spot? Yeah. It's a blind spot. I can't see it. You bet. I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is, but when we walk through the whole process, it's clear as day what the problem is, isn't it? Yeah. Those little aha moments are like, wow. Yeah, this is awesome. And they know what to do and they see the blind spot and all of a sudden, this, the process starts to work like they really intended it to. Just a couple little tweaks, isn't it? Yeah, you, you'll appreciate this. I, I an advisor I was I was trying to help. I handed him off forty super high quality, fresh leads from a live presentation he had done at one of the events that I had hosted. All of them business owners, with you know ninety five percent of them good good qualifications. Um, so he does the presentation on, on a weekend. I gave him the, the leads that weekend. Three weeks later, there had still been zero follow-up on those. And he couldn't figure out why he was having trouble getting new clients. You know, and, 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 uh, and I was having the conversation of, you know, I used to tell people that leads had a half-life of, you know, 72 hours, but now I think it's like 72 minutes. Um, you know, if somebody comes in and, and uh, requests information from you, if you don't follow up immediately, they forgot, you know, they're off to something else uh, right away. It's just it'd be like, you know, pulling out the old white pages and, and, and calling them three weeks later. They've totally forgotten you've existed. Uh, in fact, all of our data on, on online marketing is if if an outbound call initiates while they're looking at the website, your closing ratio is something like 400 percent better. Than if it's four hours later, uh, is it's just amazing how how fast things have shifted from their attention span, from their you know interest, from their even remembering that you exist uh, in in all areas. Yeah, yeah, it, it 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 exists for all marketing organizations of trying to you know build out that that process and that prospect's journey. They come in all different angles. And the most interesting thing that I learned on the financial side of things is everybody has a money issue every six months. Mm -hmm. And so we hit them in month one. Yeah, you know, no, I'm busy. In month two, yeah, no, follow up. Yeah, maybe I'll sign up for your newsletter, follow your blog. Month three. Then you call them month four. You say, oh, no, I'm busy. Call me month five. And then they call them month five. And they're like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm still really busy. And you're thinking, Geez, they've put me off. Like, forget, forget this person. And month six, you just happen to go, you know what? I'm going to give him one more chance. Oh, I'm glad you called, Grant. Let's get together and here's all my money and can you help me? You're like, what changed? What, what did I do differently? And you're dissecting your own marketing and your process and you're trying to figure out what the heck did I do wrong? It has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. It's all about when they need that product or service yeah we don't know when month six is that's the challenge with marketing if we knew what everybody was in month six oh, i mean life would be easy right oh yeah yeah and the, that's the consistency that we have to build into the process right david Dave, david ogilvy's classic line about that is that you're not marketing to a standing to a standing army you're moving advertising to a moving parade of humanity and yeah. what he means is you know, what's going on, their life changes, what their distractions are, what their interests are, what they're paying attention to is constantly changing. So out of 100 people, I might have five that are that are in the mode to entertain what you're looking at right now. But what about two months, three months, five months? I was having this conversation with with 
about 40 of my clients. I had them all rounded up on a Zoom meeting like this. And I said to them, I said, how long was it that you were paying attention to the stuff that I was doing before you actually got around to working with me directly? <laughs> Well, you know, from a, I want to explode my business is a discouraging answer, but one of them was seven years. Another one of them was nine years. Another one was three years. Another one was two years. My favorite one was one of the guys said, well, I saw some of your stuff, but the group of people I was, I was working with thought you were all an asshole. And so I ignored you for a year. And then I paid attention to something. And I just tried it and it worked so dramatically. I figured maybe I should ignore them and, and try you out. It's like, you just have to drip and drip and drip. I was having a, a conversation with somebody you would assume was smart. Again, high level guy, in this case, again, with Northwestern Mutual, not to pick on them, but uh, uh, Northwestern MBA, very sharp, analytic guy. And we were having this conversation about client follow up. And he says to me, oh, yeah, well, if I connect with them on LinkedIn or if they're on my list and they they haven't uh, done anything with me in 30 days. I delete them off everything. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, no, yeah, you yeah, never, yeah. never, ever stop following up with them. Yeah, because what do people need to know to do business with you? Who you are, what you do, are you any good? Why would I connect with you? What do you offer? Yeah. That's the cool part of marketing right now is that whole journey of discovery, being in the weeds and learning about you, just like you said, you're cyber stalking me. Mm -hmm. You get to do that journey on your own time frame, And they can now do a lot of that electronically. The, you know, the, the online marketing does a lot of the heavy lifting, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and so they show up in your office you know nothing about them. They know everything about you, what you offer, what you do, and they're ready to get down to business. Yeah. yeah. You're like, well, it's just, can we start with a name? Like, I don't even know who you are. You bet. You they bet. know everything about you. That's the whole process we're trying to create, right? Well, the nice thing about the all this new media, podcasts, YouTube channels, and so forth, is they're so, they're so personal. Um, yeah. yeah. Another advisor coach that I... Um, um, I've gotten to know him fairly well, but I, I did a, a podcast with him. His name's Dan Cuprell. And I had listened to his podcast for, you know, off and on for a year. And I knew, you know, he calls his son the drone and the name of his dog. And, you know, uh, all these like, you know, he's a fly fisherman, all these like little backstory. Now, none of it's particularly relevant for what his technical competency is and and so forth. But, but by the time I actually met him, I felt like I, I knew the guy, right? I, I, totally. I had heard all these fun stories and and I had a sense of I liked his personality and it was really, you know, really, really fascinating stuff. And I, uh, I, I have a couple of friends who are, you know, pretty high profile, you know, celebrity types. Um, and they always say it's kind of interesting when they meet people because it's uh, one, I was relaying a conversation of meeting a famous actor and he was very high profile and they both knew who each other was, but they'd never met. And he <laughs> said, it was really kind of weird. Cause you know, I know who he is. He knows who I am. He wanted to meet me. I was glad to meet him, but there was this strange dynamic, but really, I think all of our marketing should get to that point where by the time they actually meet with you, they have comfort, they have familiarity, they like you or they don't like you. They have a sense of your personality, but they also have a sense of, of competency. Um, one of the things in um, um, your conversations with that, and it is one of the, the areas that I think advisors are cowed into trembling fear from compliance, is they feel that they can't use client feedback, client testimonial, client um, um third party references on how they do other than go look them up and see if uh, they've been accused of stealing or something, you know, go look up the FINRA reference or something. Talk about yeah. that, how, how important that is for a client really develop their base. Yeah. So you and I know in marketing, whether whatever industry it is, we need to have, you know, part of those elements is what we call social proof. You bet. And, and the social proof piece could come in, you know, many different forms, you know, can come in Google reviews. Mm. It can come in, you know, whether you're loud or not to saying, you know, people have done reviews or talk to you about, or, 
you know, video testimonials on your website, but, mm -hmm. you know, then you can have, you know, social proof comes from the form of media. Hey, I was, you know, featured in this, you know, magazine or article as we see all your, you know, magazines and article mm -hmm. in your background yeah. here. Yeah. And, and so that the media becomes a, you know, social proof. So you need to, you need to think about having a potential media partner. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have one, you need to uh, try to find one, whether it be an online media partner or, or a local media partner, but that media partner will help give you that, you know, that social proof that we need. So you and I know there's very, very different ways to have that social proof, but in your marketing process, that social proof has to be in there yeah. somewhere, somehow where, you know, they're deciding between one advisor and talking to them, but this advisor over here, you know, just won an award and is featured in a magazine. Well, I think I'm going to go with this one because the social proof is there. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's the, that's the difference in the person's decision-making. We, we all do that when we're, you know, going through the decision-making process and social proof is, is, is a key piece to, to have in your marketing. Mm -hmm. And well, figuring out figuring out how to do it, there's lots of different ways. I could talk for an hour of how to do it. Yeah, and and and, and we we surely should expand on that well, <laughs> until we run out of our uh, our time here. But uh, um, well, we've been going a lot longer than I uh, I would have, have thought we were. It's a you know very engaging conversation. Um, the the social proof element, I believe, is so many advisors think. That through you know SEC, FINRA, whatever the the you know U.S. and you know uh, similar Canadian regulations that they just can't do it, and and as you just listed there, there's so many different methods of creating that social proof. Um, everything from photos of you talking to a a big audience to having your own book to being interviewed online, offline, uh, to actual client feedback. And but even the client feedback, the most of what I find most valuable in client feedback isn't anything that the regulators would be upset with. You know, it's not about uh, this person got me X returns and da, 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 you know all of that, all of that stuff. Um, it's all about I like him, I trust him, I've worked with him for many years. I you know I I feel 100. percent I mean, it's, it's that type of thing. It's more. It's more that personal validation, the media part, people perceive, of course, they perceive it falsely, but they perceive that reporters have an objective look at what's going on. They mostly don't have much perspective at all, but they, they you know, they assume that if you're on a TV show, you're on a podcast, you're on, on an interview, it's why infomercials, you know, I mean, Larry King was the king of infomercials for years because you know, you'd sit down at a round table and interview somebody and it was perceived to be, uh, you know, a high level of third party credibility. You know, that type of format uh, still has that reaction in people's mind. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, me, let me share this one idea with you that I kind of discovered in the, in the last year. Being on the, you know, looking at all the top producers, uh, you know, when I was judging them as awards. And I noticed one thing, Stephen, that was crystal clear. And I looked at every single profile and I went online, I was doing the cyber creeping like you were doing with these yeah. advisors. And I noticed that they had what I call the voice of the advisor. Mm -hmm. They had the voice of the advisor. And, and I, I love that. And, and so the, what the voice of the advisor is, you know, when your clients hear your voice, whether it be through a podcast or a video or, you know, however you put it, your clients get confidence when they hear you, right? Mm. They, 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 they trust you. They like you. They get confident. So if you had a newsletter where you put out on a monthly basis, just a quick little video clip of, you know, your thoughts or what's going on, it's always good to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the voice of the advisor, I notice all these top producers, every single one of them that were growing their business successfully, used their voice as their brand. Yeah, They use their voice as their brand. And part of that's, goes into that social proof of you're willing to put yourself out there and you're willing to, you know, open yourself up and, and do that kind of video stuff, whether it be video, whether it be audio, whether you run a radio show, whatever it is, 
getting your voice out there. <laughs> you know, I jokingly say this, Stephen, I, I don't like to do a lot of videos or do a lot on the YouTube channel. The reason why I'm already too doggone busy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be busier and I haven't done a lot of it, but every time I do a little bit of it, boom, oh, my yeah. business explodes. Yeah. And, then I, and then I'm just like everybody else in their marketing. Okay. I got to stop that. I'm too, mm -hmm. I'm too busy. Yeah. It works. It works. It works. It works. Get your voice out there. That's what I would recommend. Oh, absolutely. Especially in, in today's environment. Uh, it's so fragmented, but there's so much opportunity at the same time to, to, to steal from somebody else. Jay Abraham calls that, um, 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 episodic marketing rather than systematic marketing. And um, what I see with, with clients all the time is we get them launched in the right direction on their marketing efforts. Then they get overwhelmed and they figure out they have a systems failure. Then they back off on their marketing because they're overwhelmed. And now they don't have any clients coming in. It's like, no, 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 no. We, we, you know, we, we, we're, we're going to fix the systems and we're going to keep doing the stuff that are creating the flow. Um, they, they've started, uh, uh, my, my guys started calling it drinking from a fire hose. Yeah, okay, I understand what drinking from a fire hose now is. I'm overwhelmed. Well, that's the idea. We got to get to the point of overwhelm before you see that there's holes everywhere. And then we'll get you to fix the holes and we'll, we'll fix it from there. Correct. Uh, that, that's the capacity challenge. And that's where we work on your perfect week, perfect month, perfect quarter, perfect year. You bet. And we, we need to map that out so that what does it look like? So you, you don't do those ebbs and flows constantly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you want to do this marketing event this quarter because you need clients next quarter and the mm -hmm. quarter after. Yeah. Not not today or the next 30 days, right? Exactly, exactly. And and when you, when you get into that systemization, you know, a, a lot of them are just doing things they shouldn't be doing at all, right? Do you get the 80, 20, you know, really it's probably 95, five. Uh, but a, a lot of what would be real systematic follow-up can be automated or it can be delegated. But if you don't know what it is, you haven't completely, as I'm sure you do a lot with the practice management, if you haven't sketched out step one, step two, step three, here's the timeline, here's what should be happening, here's what needs to be done by a human, here's what can be automated, here's what we shouldn't do at all, then you, 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 don't, you don't have a starting point. And I think that's because most advisors end up with a relatively successful practice that's driven by their own personality. Is, is personality driven, it's not systems driven. And, and then the hardest part is figuring out how to duplicate themselves. I, I have a very successful advisor right now who's been frustrated with five staff members so far, and I keep having the conversation with him, is you're not trying to go find yourself again. What you're trying to do is create the systems so that things will work appropriately with the people you can find to plug in to run the thing. And he has this idea that the only way to fix it is go find him and hit another him. <laughs> of course, yeah, that's in all likelihood not going to happen. Yeah, finding a finding a mini me is very difficult. Yes. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That uh that always leads back to uh, you know, Gerber's book, um, um The E Myth. E Myth, yeah, yeah. Um creating systems that you can plug people into rather than, you know, having to find the perfect person. Yeah, yeah. And you you gotta know what you're looking for, you gotta know what the numbers are, and you get you have to know your capacity. And capacity yeah. comes in two levels. It's like your, yeah, your numbers and your personal, and it comes down to the math and so forth. But it's also the emotional capacity, right? And and we know that, you know, most humans can manage, you know, 75 to 150 relationships. Well, you get beyond that. And that's, you know, some people can do it a mm -hmm. lot. It's very challenging. And, yeah. and that's when the overwhelm comes. It's like, you know, you got a 10,000 square foot warehouse, mm -hmm. you get 12,000 square feet of stuff and six trucks parked outside yeah. and you're trying to get more mm -hmm. and you can't, you just can't. So you're operating at 125% capacity and we do the forest fire exercise, you know, forest yeah. fire exercise, when the trees get too thick, lightnings comes, burns the whole thing down. You start all over. Well, you got to think about doing that in your practice, like, Mm -hmm. Okay, let's burn it down to the ground, start all over so different things can grow. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about your 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 winter home there in California. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
Here, I, I, I was seeing on the news that California is choking on Canadian smoke. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, it seemed like the story of, of my life here in the mountains of Colorado has been choking on California smoke for the last three or four years. My uh, my son's pretty serious asthmatic. So I have air, you know, those air cleaners everywhere in the house and the new, you know, filtration system just to just to filter out California fire uh, uh, forest fires. Of course, Colorado yeah. catches fire, too, but not not at quite that level. You need you need California emissions in your house. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Something, something. Big, big catalytic converter on the roof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. The um, um, you, you know I I, I want to be uh, respectful of your time. We've been we've been going for over an hour here, believe it or not. But uh, uh, what what haven't I asked? What what should uh, what if you were going to give an advisor two or three places to start? What would what would be the uh, uh, the thing for them to think about immediately. So the first thing is, you know, they need clarity around where it is they're going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, how many times have you seen an, an ad or a commercial or an email saying, Hey, get, you know, 25 more leads and grow your business. Mm -hmm. It's nothing wrong with that, but really having a clear sense of what you're actually trying to build at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, and once you get that clarity, it becomes a heck of a lot easier, as you and I know, to make the decisions on the marketing, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, my mentor, Bill Backrack, always uses this quote from Roy Disney, when your values are clear, your decisions are easy. Yeah, that's a good one. And so you really get crystal clear on your, you know, start with your values of what it is you're trying to accomplish and why. Mm -hmm. and, and once you have that, then you're going to be able to, to go and say, okay, this is, you know, this is the ladder of success. I want to kind of climb, but I, I want to make sure it's, it's leaning on the right wall. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and That's so the old Covey quote, climb yeah. the ladder of success and find out it's leaned on the wrong wall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the first thing is clarity around your business. Like it goes back to my six components. The second thing is, is have your marketing plan in writing, have it on paper. Right. Yeah. I, I, I do this exercise for advisors. So a great place to start is on your desk. If you don't have your ideal client criteria, mm -hmm. what are you looking for? Yeah. We're, 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 we're doing marketing. We're, you know, sending out messages. We're communicating with people. This is what we're looking for. This is the ideal. It's yeah. okay to deal with everybody else because you need to do that when you start starting out as an advisor, as you know. But that gives you time to build your ideal, ideal, you know, clients or ideal families. And so, yeah. so having that crystal clear, and then having your marketing plan in writing, and 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 you know, Jay Levinson, my you know my co-author, taught me, you know, marketing plan backwards. Where do you want to be in one, three, five years, whatever the number is, yeah. and plan it backwards, and put that on paper. And now you've got exactly what, you know, you know where you're going. You, you got clarity on where you're going. And then you got something, a plan in writing. And now write that plan down every single Monday morning. Yeah. That's the discipline of implementation. You bet. We, we got great ideas. We can go to conferences. We come back supercharged. And a week later, we're like, okay, start over. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I write down my goals every Monday morning, Stephen, and I did that for years. And I actually learned that from, you know, a Covey, you know, Covey course that mm -hmm. I took. Yeah. And every Monday morning, I write down what it is I'm actually trying to accomplish. And it's just, it just keeps embedding that implementation of what do I need to implement to move this forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, um, um, again, you, 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 you brushed on it lightly, but, most advisors are are just kind of like going after junk leads rather than having a clear picture of of who ideally they'd like to get to and then figuring out what the best and easiest way to get to them is and the your ideal client knows other ideal clients they are involved with organizations they're involved with companies they're involved with associations charitable activities where those people flock together and, you know, and, and, and you mentioned this before, but to reemphasize, you know, if you, if you have your, uh, uh, your client list 
and you're getting referrals from the bottom half, or if you haven't rounded up the people that you want, you're just going to end up with more people who don't fit your, your uh, ideal profile. You've got to find out how to go be the guest speaker at their convention, how to be in their magazine, how to get invited along to their events, how to go to their charity functions, whatever it might be, but how to end up in that circle of influence and then it skyrockets you from there. But, but Stephen, how do you, I agree with you, but how do you change the behavior of, okay, well, I got, I got my, you know, my Wednesday, my Thursday kind of clear, I'm not doing much anyways. And a non-ideal client or prospect or someone comes in and wants to spend some time and like, mm -hmm. okay, well, what the heck? I, I'm not doing anything anyway. So I'll spend some time with them. How do you yeah. stop that behavior? Well, I think you have to be very intentional about what it is you're looking for. And again, as you mentioned, have it written down, be looking at it and be very clear. But also, you know, why are you just sitting at your desk with random time? Um, is I'd much rather be, you know, if I if I want to be a, a, a friend of mine, um, uh, and if, if you don't mind, I, I heard part of the story was you ended up out of your advisor because your daughter had some health issues. A good friend of mine was a, was a practicing dentist who yeah. ended up coaching um, um, dentists how to create an income outside of their practice and how to get out of their practice. But his backstory was his daughter had serious illness. He couldn't, he couldn't run his practice and attend to his daughter. And then he became very intentional about who he's looking for and what he's trying to accomplish and, and so forth. But if I'm very intentional about there's this group of people that I'm looking at, I'm much better off taking the CEO to lunch and working on building out that network than just taking cold, you know, conversations coming in. And again, you know, a, a, a high profile guru in the, in the industry, I was, you know, reading their, their materials. And one of the things he says, everybody needs our service. Well, <laughs> okay. I mean, maybe so, but as an advisor, you shouldn't think that way. You should be thinking in terms of I'm the ideal person for this group of people. They're going to enrich my life. I'm going to enrich their life. I'm going to go focus on that. And everybody else, I can be nice, send them in the right direction and so forth. But I've got to go focus on that. And it always seems like the hardest time is when you're living hand to mouth to turn down money. But if you if you get distracted with things that aren't in your five-year, where do I want this to end up? You're never going to get to that point. And, and frankly, I've always found it a little bit the opposite. The busier you get, then more opportunity is pouring your way. I, I, I like Steve Jobs' favorite quote. You know, my favorite Steve Jobs quote, I, I might say, is, you know, he's more proud of all the things they didn't do than the yeah. things he did. It's, yeah. And, um, um, you know, the story of him taking over Apple was he killed like 95% of their product line. Um, everybody thought he was crazy and he produced the most valuable company, you know, in the history of the world. Yeah. 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 Less is more, right? Yeah. Yeah. Less, yeah. less, less is more. And coming, hey, coming back to that realization. All right. This is, this has been great. We better wrap it up. We're, uh, uh, been longer of, of chewing up your time than I expected. But I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, if somebody wants to get more information about what you do and how you do it, I I'm here looking at you advisor practice management.com. Uh, is that the best place for them to go, or is there a, a good place for them to track down more information? Yeah, just just go there, and and I encourage you to to sign up for the the blog. I write it on a weekly basis, and it's really case studies of advisors that I'm working with and different challenges. I don't really mention their names or who they are, but that's where all the content comes out of. It's it's mm -hmm. live current content of of different things that we're working on. Yeah. So just subscribe to that blog and some of them you'll be like, yeah, no, that's not my practice. But some of them would be like, yeah, that, that that's me. That's my practice. And that's one of my challenges. You know, I, I spend, you know, 30 hours a week on Zoom working with top advisors trying to help solve their problems and challenges and issues. And then I just kind of share some of them uh, on a blog. Yeah. So that's the easiest way to to kind of follow it and just go, oh, yeah, no, that 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 would be interesting you know, because I have that exact same problem or ex very similar challenge. And, and here's a couple different ways to, to approach it. Right. So yeah, well, check what, it out, check it out and subscribe. Well, what, what you just said is a, is a excellent criteria for judging the efficacy of advice you get anyway, right. Is the world is changing dramatically. If yeah. somebody doesn't have their toes dipped in right now, 
they're looking over their numbers or looking out over other people's numbers. Um, in, in every niche, one of the problems is, is the person who's running a very high performing business themselves, oftentimes it's their personality. It's not the ability to replicate systems. But when you've replicated it through 30 other businesses or 300 other businesses or whatever it might be, and you've got your finger on the pulse of their numbers and are able to see what's happening in real time, that's where the advice is super valuable. I okay. see, um, you know, in, in every niche, but certainly this is just as bad. People who, you know, they're talking about what they knew work 20 years ago and other people who really don't have a feedback loop of, of working belly to belly and face to face with folks who are actually out in the field and know what their numbers are and know what's, know what's working. And especially it, it, when you get to the marketing side, but even the people management, I mean, the people management side is changing dramatically. Working with current 20 or 30 year olds is a lot different than it was 15 or 20 years ago. The work environment expectations, uh, the culture, the the psychological uh, interaction is different on the marketing side. Hell, Google changes every every ninety days. So does the uh, uh, online marketing environment and all other uh, all other areas. If you're not really on top of what's working now, it, you, it, it's really kind of worthless advice. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 not we're not you know trying to trying to fix our you know our car with a 1972 manual, right? Yeah. It, it's it's yeah. what's working right now. What's the what's you know what is happening right now in the in the current environment for financial advisors, and that's really what people kind of want to you know know when they're tackling you know their their issues because there's so many you know different websites and there's lots of material out there that is dated and old right yeah. and you, yeah. you showed a copy of my book and you know half of that is dated and old and there's some old materials I, you know I, I went through my one of my older books thinking oh yeah maybe there's some good ideas from there and there wasn't a lot there was yeah. not a lot that applies to today it, yeah. it, it changes. So that's a, that's a great point, Stephen is, yeah. is look for some stuff that is right now. Cause that, yeah. that's, that's, what's going to truly apply to your practice. Yeah. Hey, it's, it's been wonderful. I've, I've enjoyed yes. talking to you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah. And I appreciate I will, it. Uh, I will shut down all of our recordings here and we'll be uh, uh, 